Hi, so I know that this isn't a part of my usual content, but this is mainly just a passion project of mine, as well as an advertisement for my second channel where I primarily make death battle content. It has been growing a more sizable audience within just a few videos, and that's great, but I wanted to put more effort into this series, so I just decided, screw it, let's bring this over to the main channel. You could use the views anyway. Although if you're subscribed to both of my channels, uh, you have bragging rights in the comments, I guess. Though, if you're one of those people who are more familiar with my second channel and I've never once considered checking out my main channel for whatever reason, gotcha. In case you couldn't tell by the direct references to the episodes and even some of the memes, I like Death Battle. I've been a fan of this series for so long that the Revision 3 logo still lives in my head rent free. Because I don't want it to pay any rent. And as of right now, the show has been going strong for 10 seasons, growing the series over the course of nearly 12 years. So to celebrate all of this, I thought about doing a year-spanning retrospective of the entire series and ranking every episode within the first 10 seasons. While there are some episodes in the series that I rewatch pretty regularly whenever I feel aimless, a lot of these I haven't checked out in forever, so I'm expecting this retrospective to have quite a few surprises for better or for worse. But I think that the least surprising bit is that if season one was uploaded in any time after the early 2010s, no one would let that series take off, I swear. Despite season 1 collectively having more views than every season aside from maybe season 2, this season's pretty rough. The animation is obviously outdated, Wiz and Boomsticks sound almost the exact same, the jokes are really cringy and make no sense. You could tell that this was Baby's first internet show. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that the entire series was made by Ben Singer by himself up until Peach vs Zelda where he was finally able to get some help, but even then that was just on the animation. I mean of course you had Chad voicing Boomstick as always, and he did have a couple executive producers helping him get the show uploaded at all, but aside from that, Ben did everything by himself. I like looking at season 1 of Death Battle as a product of its time. I say this because a lot of the content did involve mid to late 2000s slash early 2010s internet humor. I'll get into what I mean by that, but keep in mind this is the time period where people unironically believed that Mega Man 2 was peak gaming, yet Sonic Unleashed and Riders were considered to be just as bad, if not worse, than Sonic 06. As someone who grew up in this era, I am fully expecting this type of humor to be prevalent throughout basically the entire season. And I'll point it out as often as I can. And since this is the kind of season where you just need to grow up with it in order to love it, I'm gonna hold this season to a lower standard to literally every other season of the show. And believe me, with this first episode, I'm coming in with no standards at all. <laughs> The first episode was where the connections were just bounty hunters, and that's about it. Oh jeez, I forgot about how fast that transition is. These analysis segments were kinda hilarious to me. Obviously Wiz and Boomstick do sound similar, but Wiz especially sounds super into it. As if they were trying to audition for the role of a WWE commentator duo, or even a musical number. Honestly, it's not that different from how I try to portray myself in my videos. So when I say a lot of this jokes in here made me laugh, keep in mind that none of the jokes are actually funny. I just keep laughing at how ridiculous this time period was. I mean, you have bangers like BAM! shoot the woo As well as Wiz directly responding to Boomstick throughout pretty much the entirety of Bulba's analysis with the whole That's no ordinary spacesuit, Boomstick. Or Bird DNA, Boomstick. Bird DNA. And of course, That's right, Boomstick. Which is said twice in this episode. Another thing they mention is that Boba Fett supposedly holds his own against Darth Vader, but as someone who knows that they've used this comic panel three different times, I can tell you that Boba Fett does not hold his own against Darth Vader. And then we we get to the fight and- AH! <laughs> the health bar sound effect! <laughs> oh my gosh! I will say that this perspective shot right here is actually pretty well done. The way that they utilize the blur effects almost makes you forget that Samus' screw attack isn't actually changing direction, unlike Boba. That's pretty cool. But at the same time, there is the moment where Samus is slowly creeping up in her morph ball mode as Boba disconnects his controller, and then Samus' theme plays after the power bomb with a kill that has really slow pacing, but for the time, this was pretty good. I'm sure that if they remade this episode, they could make this kill look even cooler. Who knows? Oh, but now on to the conclusions. Ugh. 
The best things I can say are that these season one conclusions are proof that the whole animation doesn't mean much in the outcome is a pure crock of sh**, and I don't want to hear otherwise. That said, the conclusions can still suck. Samus is one fourth the size of an average vehicle. <laughs> what? Aside from that, there's not as much to talk about as I would have liked. It's clearly a bad episode, but in hindsight, it's the funny kind of bad. The one where you can get a good laugh out of it. 56 out of 100, entirely for ironic enjoyment. And also because it's the first episode. <laughs> For those who know my thoughts on death battle, requested matchups, as well as just the matchups I like to see, I make it no secret that I dislike the vast majority of rivalry matchups. But out of all the rivalry matchups, Street Fighter vs Mortal Kombat is probably one of my least favorites. I just don't think the tone of either series match each other beyond just being fighting games. But even then, Street Fighter vs King of Fighters is just an objectively better rivalry in every sense of the word and I fail to see how it isn't. And likewise, Akuma vs Shang Tsung is a complete mismatch, as it's just the final boss of Street Fighter Mortal Kombat, and that's about it. I don't deny that this was a very big rivalry during the time, but over time it's just gotten less and less and less interesting. But don't mistake me as me saying that the episode is bad just because I don't like the matchup, as this episode is definitely not the case. I do think that Akuma's analysis is pretty solid for the time. You do still have Wiz being way too into it, but it's still just as funny as ever, and they actually cover a few other interesting tidbits, such as bringing up that the theory of Akuma sacrificing his soul to a demon. I mean, nowadays it could be seen as a minor tangent, but from what I've looked into, it was actually a popular theory during the time, and probably best to address it. I also think it's really amusing to see game balancing being used to determine the stats of a character from a versus standpoint, since like nowadays that is absolutely not how versus debating works. But back then nobody knew the difference between versus stats and game balance. Hell, in the Pokemon series, Mewtwo is heavier than Charizard, but in Smash Bros, Mewtwo is a lightweight and Charizard is a heavyweight. Oh no, also, Kongo Kokoretsuzan. That's right, Boomstick. <laughs> Shang Tsung's analysis, not the most interesting, but this is the second episode, so what can you do? With that said, Man, I wish I could morph into anybody I wanted. I could have some fun with that. 2010's humor moment. Now on to the fight. These combos look really fast and flashy. Everything you could want in a good fighting game episode. If only they stuck to the style of animation when one of the combatants was able to return. But let's not worry about that. I do like the toasty reference, but I'm not too keen on this moment where Akuma's about to chop Shang Tsung, but then he randomly stops when he transforms and just lets him come back up. Okay? And there's also Shang Tsung just walking into a raw super. Oh, what a nice guy! <laughs> oh, but then comes the part where Shang Tsung transforms into Akuma. Oh, 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 holy sh**! This, this animation goes so hard, I swear. It's actually really impressive how hard this goes. I mean, yeah, you can see them mirroring attacks, but the fact that they're both matching each other's attacks perfectly, while the health bars are also not decreasing at all, also the music adding to the intensity, mm. This is actually really, really good. And then you have Shang Tsung about to finish him off with the Kongo Kokoretsu-san. Didn't even need to look at the script that time, get f***ed. But then Akuba is just able to use the Shun Gokusatsu, defeating his opponent, and Shang Tsung slowly losing his Akuma form. Now on to the conclusion, and I do like how they tried to contextualize the weird moment with Akuma's attack stopping during Shang Tsung's transformation, but seeing a new face on the same body probably wouldn't result in him being that confused. Otherwise, for a season 1 episode, this is actually pretty high quality. There's not a lot of jank, not a lot of bad moments. The worst that you can say is there are a couple minor nitpicks in the animation, the conclusion is a bit weird, and maybe the analysis portions aren't that interesting. So I don't think I have any issue giving this episode a 69 out of 100. Nah! Nice episode. Oh Martel, I shouldn't have said 69. Why do I get the feeling that there was a very strong reason that GoDaddy was used as the advertisement of this episode? For all of the hundreds of Marvel vs DC matchups that have happened on Death Battle, the very first one has the incredibly deep connections of women. I mean, to be fair, it is at least super heroin, and there is the whole Marvel vs. DC rivalry, but... <sighs> this episode is probably the biggest example of early 2010s humor. Every woman vs. woman episode in season 1 was a cat fight because WOMEN CAN'T FIGHT, they imply after having the woman Samus beat the man Boba Fett, but okay. And it also birthed the notorious horny boomstick. It's exactly what it sounds. Not just lusting over Rogue and Wonder Woman at every chance he gets, but also saying that he would, uh, do something to Ms. Marvel while she's unconscious. That's always fun. Yeah, early 2010s humor was exactly like this. I'm not excusing it. I am absolutely going to be docking points off this episode for this. I just want to contextualize why this exists in the first place. The only other worth note is Cannon's resting right below her neck. What? What? 
What the fuck are you talking about? Even killing the Greek god of war, Ares. Hear that, Kratos? A chick beat you to it. You say that like Diana isn't one of the strongest DC heralds ever. Then on to the fight. The only bit where there's no sexualization. Not gonna lie, I kind of miss the health bars. I understand why they're gone. Akuma versus Shang Tsung basically did everything you could do with the health bars. But I found that to kind of add to the charm of those two episodes. Aside from that, <laughs> man, the look at this fight is not good. Wonder Woman's sprites being so limited and stiff compared to Rogue's more elaborate and complex sprites is so damn funny to me. Not to mention that a lot of this fight is just a bunch of generic aerial fights. A couple of them look good, but more often than not, they're just kind of the same thing. Rush at each other, punching and kicking and flying. Rush at each other, punching and kicking and flying. Rush at each other, by flying, I guess. And then you get to the part where Rogue is able to seal her powers. And of course, it's on the thigh. And then it's just kind of the same sets of attacks over and over again. At least until the ending when... Good night, sugar. Yep. And the conclusion. Once again, more horny boomstick? Okay. Also, they say that Diana could resist Rogue's abilities in the same way that Juggernaut could? Okay. Also, these bars don't even look that much bigger than Diana's, but... Okay. Thorough Amazonian training being a weakness? That's actually kind of funny when you realize that so many losers have been stated to have superior training, but the fact that this is an actual factor in the matchup, that's comedy gold. But yeah, even though I'm holding season 1 to a lower standard, I can't defend a single part of this episode beyond saying that this was just 2010's humor. Overall, I'd give it a 32 out of 100, but the gross content bumps it down to a 25 out of 100. Easily one of my least favorite episodes of all time. <laughs> Goomba vs. Koopa is kind of an important episode to me. This was actually the first episode of Death Battle I ever watched. I mean, I was just a kid in like 5th or 6th grade or something, aimlessly browsing YouTube because I just discovered it for the first time, and then I came across this video called Goomba vs. Koopa. I thought it was the funniest thing ever as a kid, so I clicked on it. Then I watched it and I was like, HOLY sh! THIS IS ALSO THE COOLEST THING EVER! WHOA! And that's how I became a Death Battle fan. However, I haven't really watched this episode since that day, so out of all the Season 1 episodes, I'm the most excited to revisit this one. So let's see if I'm still able to love it just as much. For Goomba's analysis, hearing them talk about the Goomba's backstory felt actually kind of nostalgic because, HEY I REMEMBER THAT! I USED TO READ THAT IN THE MARIO BASEBALL BIOS ALL THE TIME! Not that it's anything special, I just found that kind of neat. I also thought that the whole- It takes some real spores if you know what I'm saying. All right, that one kind of got me a bit. Though the telekinesis joke is not as funny as I remember. And as for Koopa's analysis, they say that Koopas are skilled in basketball while showing a render from Mario Strikers. I mean, I do like the Ninja Turtles bit, but they actually show up the Koopa Brothers. That was cute. But regardless of any interesting tidbits or decent jokes, both analyses end with Boomstick calling them stupid and cowards. But given that this is a joke episode, that's kind of the point. And now on to the fight. I will admit that I was kind of weirded out by seeing them start off with wings, but it's fine. That dumb Goomba face that flips for no reason though. And then you have the scene with the thwomps, but the Koopa gets crushed and is somehow fine? I mean, I'm pretty sure getting crushed kills Koopas too, you know, but okay. But then we get to the scene between all the cannons and the bullet bills. Ooh, 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 this is, this is good. And then you have the sun joining the fight with the Goomba getting hit and the Koopa dodging it in time. Just as a nice touch to show that the Koopa is slightly smarter than the Goomba. And then you see the Karibos boot scene. I mean, this bit does drag on for a bit too long to a point where there's basically no more anticipation after like three seconds. But then we go in the warp pipe. The Koopa is completely helpless. The red Goombas are being the opera of the backing track. There's the Close up of the nearby lava, and the Goomba is slowly approaching. Then he punts the Koopa shell. Double KO. That is the best way to end this episode. Also, Dry Bones is a nice touch. Overall, surprisingly strong episode, not gonna lie. 74 out of 100. Good joke episode. I'd like to point out that Hagar vs Zangief is technically a same series matchup, but a lot of people considered Hagar to be a Final Fight character rather than a Street Fighter character, especially since you've never seen them in the same game. If Death Battle ever wants to do any more rematches, I think that this is going to be the least likely one, at least out of all the episodes that I'm willing to acknowledge. But if nothing else, the analysis portions do make you think that these characters are from different series. Like, how did I not know Hagar was Scottish? That's pretty interesting. Oh, and also there's this bit. This is fan art, and they just go so in-depth with it, too. <laughs> wow. 
Zangief's analysis is a little better though. While driving the Suri Brown Bears in a tornado, that's a cool feat. I miss the banishing flat. Also, were both of their end clips dorkly memes or something? I don't know, something about them just looked kind of odd. Regardless, onto the fight. It's kind of short, not a lot happens, but I do like a couple things here and there. Hagar dodging Zangief's lariat before responding with his own is a nice reference to how they say Hagar has the original lariat. And of course the ending is good and has some nice anticipation. And since both characters are lying on the floor, there is at least a moment where it makes you want who actually survived that until you see that Hagar's bleeding and Zangief isn't. Kind of weird that I never noticed this as a kid, but oh well. But aside from that, a lot of it just takes place inside of a building that, for the most part, we don't even see what they're doing inside of it. And also Pedo Bear for some reason. More early 2010s humor. Conclusion's fine. Boomstick obsessing over Hagar's mustache is really dumb, but oh well. I give it a solid 60 out of 100. There's not much to talk about. The next episode, however. Okay, you know you're in for a good episode when Wiz says right Boomstick instead of that's right Boomstick. The TMNT Battle Royale is a special episode to talk about. And you wouldn't think that right away because the analysis portions don't have a lot to say. Except for one. Yeah, Mikey's analysis section is probably the one thing that people remember from this episode, but not for the right reasons. They start off by saying he's the goofball of the team and how lazy he is. And then Boomstick starts saying he's on drugs and he unironically tries to back this up like pointing out his bad eating habits, his incoherent phrases. Um, what incoherent phrases? You mean cowabunga? The thing that every turtle says? Okay. The bong got its own section for some reason. Also made by Donatello, what? But then Wiz starts talking and, oh, I wish that he never did. He points out how Mikey's nunchaku aren't weapons because they were originally used as farming tools, but say it's fine with Raph's weapons. And they say that baseball bats can be used the same way, despite the fact that no, they can't. They aren't nearly as lightweight or flexible, but he's still adamant about the nunchaku being a bunch of useless clubs, as if taking a club to the head isn't gonna deal any damage. But then there's this little gem of a moment. The great master splinter gave the most complicated weapon to the re of the group. Believe it or not, this is also a part of early 2010s humor. I guess you could say in terms of understanding the problems of this word, they were a little, say, retardando. Music comp humor, baby! And speaking as someone who technically is on the autism spectrum himself, as well as someone who's friends with other people who are also on the spectrum, hell yes, I consider this a slur. And I don't think it's a surprise to find out that an entire third of this episode's Road to 100 blog was Ben saying how wrong he was to use this word in the first place, let alone as a means of directly insulting a fictional character. Also, Mikey's analysis portion ends with Mikey's not gonna win this fight, is he? He better not. Mikey calling him cranky is low-key a funny fourth wall reference, though. Even though it's absolutely not intentional nor fourth wall break. Screw it. I'm gonna try to get whatever enjoyment I can out of Mikey's analysis. But anyways, on to the fight. Mikey barely even lasts 10 seconds in a fight that lasts 1 minute and 20 seconds. Aside from that, there's quite a few moments that stick out to me. I like how Donnie's staff attack on the boxes references the Ninja Turtles NES game. I mean, they did use this clip quite a lot in Donnie's analysis. And I like how they try to have this cinematic shot where Raph wakes up following his beatdown from Donnie, but his sprites are so blurry that it's kind of hard to notice it, but eh, wasn't their fault. Also, Donnie's death is brutal and somehow kind of in character. I mean, obviously it's not in character that Raph would just kill Donnie, but if he had to, I could see this doing it. Especially with the added detail of Donnie being the one to deal the majority of damage to Raph at the start. And then it's just a final showdown between Raph and Leo. And I gotta say, this is actually really well done. The final clash is intense, it's got good music to it, and the kill is really, really good. Originally, I was confused as to how Leo won since they both were stabbed in the chest, but then you notice that Leo went for Raph's throat, while Raph just blindly stabbed Leo through the stomach, demonstrating Leo's advantage in skill and experience compared to Raph's. And even then, Leo still looks damaged. Nice ending. And I even like how this was the crux of their argument in the conclusion. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that the conclusion is total bollocks, but hey, this was all they needed to say and they said it. I just wish that the whole argument about Raph winning in the movie wasn't so stupid. They boiled it down to the fight being plot constructed and the movie not making much sense, apparently. Look, Leo not wanting to fight and beating Raph in the fist fight beforehand was all they really needed to say. 
Oh, man, as you can tell, there's a lot of conflicting feelings I have about this episode. I really, really want to like it. Not just because I really like the Ninja Turtles, and this was one of my favorite episodes back in the day, but there is genuinely a lot of great and impressive stuff here. The fight has really cool moments, and there are even some neat little character moments here and there. But man, Mikey's analysis and actually Mikey's portrayal in general really bring this episode down. On top of a few really boring analysis sections and a conclusion that's just petty and weird, <sighs> the highest score I can give it is a um, um, uh, 63 out of 100. Yeah, let's go with that. This episode had a really cool idea of having the winner of a previous battle royale now facing on to fight a supposedly stronger opponent. But did you know that Leonardo was originally going to fight Tommy Oliver, the White Ranger, before the team suggested he should fight a Battletoads character? Well, Leo definitely wouldn't have come back from that one, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but he did eventually get to fight a Power Ranger nearly a decade later, albeit it was Jason the Red Ranger. But anyways, on to Zitz versus Leonardo. Zitz's analysis only has one thing worth mentioning and it's this. I'm a big bad mother of all toads! Why does he talk like that? I gotta check out this cartoon pilot. Looks like my kind of cringe. Then we get to Leonardo's analysis. A lot of it is just the same, but the few new added bonuses. Like, Leo was the only Ninja Turtle to study under two masters? Huh? Where was that in the conclusion of the previous episode? And also apparently this leads to the compositing problem where they composite multiple versions of the Ninja Turtles. I mean, I guess it didn't bother me too much in the original since they were at least trying to cover the most recognizable features of the Ninja Turtles. But I do think it's more problematic here because they bring up factors from other Ninja Turtle series and it is kind of jarring. Anything I can find to talk about these analysis portions don't really exist. Like the moon landing. Shut up. Why is that so topical? <laughs> but then the fight. Ooh, that's rough. Zitz's sprites look so hideous. Or at least they don't look like they're chroma keyed correctly. Then you also have Zitz tweening as he throws Leo. And, um, um... I mean, this episode is just a lot of boring attacks and beatdowns until the sewer scene. The animations just don't look right. Leonardo is getting hit in a bunch of different ways, yet is still using the same hurt sprite. Then the fight does take to the sewers, and it gets a little better. Leo using some sneak attacks, and even hiding in the water before killing him. Kind of disappointing that the fight doesn't even last a minute. But for a fight that's just mostly there, eh, 52 out of 100. Yeah. I'm Wizard and he's Boomstick What? This episode is still kind of funny for me, but again, not for the right reasons. Don't worry, there's no sense of early 2010s humor in here. I just think it's funny how people thought that Smash Brothers mattered in verses. They even used it as a means of scaling Yoshi to previous death battle winner Samus Aran. Though I will admit, the baby launcher joke is funny, especially with how Wiz criticizes it for its impracticality rather than its moral implications. <laughs> That just sounds like Wiz to me. Yoshi's maybe asexual. That poor miserable creature. I'm gonna choose to ignore that. Anyways, on to Riptor's analysis. And the most I can say about it is how Boomstick is actually talking a lot about Velociraptors and Wiz is genuinely impressed. But now that I learned that Velociraptors being pack hunters is a very, very common and supposedly obnoxious misconception. Ah, he was doing so well. Ah. Not gonna lie, Wiz actually made me feel proud of Boomstick for all this supreme knowledge on Velociraptors. Only to find out that if you dig deep enough, some of the stuff he says about him is just completely untrue. It's also weird how they set up a joke, but it ends before it gets a punchline. And that's how we end Riptor's analysis? Eh. Now on to the fight, and... Okay. Personally, I don't mind Yoshi coming across as afraid in this fight that much, but I wouldn't say I'd go all the way to cowardice. A lot of the fight is just Riptor trying to get a hit and Yoshi just running away. The baby Yoshi scene is fine, the combos are fine, I like the combo breaker, that's fine. Though I will say, for all the future episodes where they have the winner getting mostly bodied until winning after getting one lucky hit, it's funny how this episode is self-aware enough to have Yoshi literally pull the win out of his ass. I mean, I liked how he was able to absorb Riptor's acid and then throw it back at him, blinding him. But Yoshi doesn't really do a lot of interesting things with it, so it doesn't really matter. And the death is also kind of abrupt. He just falls on a car that happens to be there. No, my car! Okay, I'll admit that's a cute joke. The conclusion to this episode gets memed on because a lot of people boil it down to Haha, Yoshi wins because he can drive cars. Which... I mean, that is kind of what they do. But they also mention his varied arsenal and digestive system countering Riptor's abilities, but shh, Yoshi only won because he can drive cars. And he's asexual. But otherwise, 58 out of 100. Not a dynamite dino fight. Sorry, Boomstick. <laughs> 
Before going into this episode, I'd like to point out that Tao Kaka's English VA, Felice Sampler, passed away in July of 2021. I actually just found out about that while working on this series and scrolling through the comments of this episode. So yeah, she was a legend. Rest in peace. Anyways, I feel like if Felicia vs. Tao Kaka wasn't a season 1 episode, it'd have the same level of vibe as a matchup like a Slayer vs. Dimitri. But as for the analysis portions, neither character has a lot to talk about. I mean, in Felicia's analysis, you at least have Wiz calling out Boomstick on his horniness. And it is actually built up to a horny Boomstick joke rather than the joke being Boomstick is suddenly horny. So that's a nice touch. They also go over Felicia's backstory, albeit sporadically, talking about her background at the beginning, then proceeding to go over her appearance and abilities, and then going back to bringing up how she became a nun. Probably would have been handled in a more interesting way if this was a more recent episode, but what can you do? Tao Kaka, as much as I really like the character, there's not a lot to talk about in her analysis either. It's kind of just the same white noise as Felicia's analysis, with nothing really interesting to say. Unfortunately, Tao has an incredibly severe case of ADHD. Whoa! <laughs> okay! Okay, Wiz! This is not actually a problem with the episode. Because for one, apparently there are Blaze Blue fans who headcanon Tao Kaka being on the autism spectrum. I've also seen other headcanons that she actually does have ADHD. And two, Tao Kaka actually is an idiot. She was Ragna's childhood friend, yet she doesn't remember it apart from Ragna being good guy. Yet she's also a bounty hunter that's supposed to be hunting him down for his bounty, but she keeps forgetting about it. Tao Kaka is an idiot, but I love her for that. I was just simply caught off guard that Wiz would immediately go, Oh, what a cute little kitty. She has extreme ADHD. And to think that this is far from the only time they use these exact words. All right, but aside from that, Tao Kaka's analysis has nothing else to say. It ends with her calling Lychee the booby lady, and then the fight starts. Kind of weird how the butterfly doesn't cause the fight and instead being Felicia bumping into Tao Kaka. But there's a reason why the butterfly stays alive. I really wanted to like this fight and say it was super underrated and overlooked, even if it's a season one fight, but there's just not a lot that happens. I mean, I like how Felicia is able to turn around Tao's beatdown with her command grab. That's a cool maneuver. I like how they both get distracted by the butterfly, and Tao Kaka making Felicia cry by accidentally killing it is funny. I like how Tao uses her astral heat as a finisher, and her victory animation still makes me smile, but ugh, a lot of it is just back and forth combos. It's a lame way to progress a fight and it just lasts for way too long. Although another thing worth noting is that apparently Tao flips off Felicia as she's killing her. The conclusion is also okay. They say that at most Tao has a slight speed advantage, but they also say that Felicia's tail is strong enough to lift her 120 pound body, and apparently her claws can also tear through metal armor, whereas they didn't really give Tao anything, not even for speed. This unfortunately leads to another episode of White Noise. I'm giving it a noticeably higher score than Zitz vs. Leonardo just because it's at least an adequate animation. 56 out of 100. <laughs> Kratos vs. Spawn is interesting to talk about. Out of all the characters overdue for a runback, these two are among some of, if not the most requested characters for a runback. But at the same time, you could do a rematch of Kratos vs. Spawn, because the matchup is actually kind of solid. And I will admit, with these past few episodes having mostly uninteresting and kind of stale analysis portions, I actually really like the analyses of Kratos and Spawn. As the hot white ashes of his family clung permanently to his skin. Just like Michael Jackson! What? What's that even mean? Okay, but for real talk, these are two of the only season one analyses that actually put some effort into going over the characters, which I do appreciate. And I also like how the Blade of Olympus was being analyzed as not just a tool in his arsenal, but also a story beat. That was really cool. And you also have Spawn's analysis, having a healthy balance of covering his story and arsenal. Boomstick saying that God looks like his Nana is kind of funny. Also, Spawn's end clip is genuinely badass, not gonna lie, Wiz. But on to the fight. There's actually quite a bit that goes into this animation. I mean, yeah, Spawn's chains are tweening all over the place. Lol. Kratos gets to use a lot of his arsenal while Spawn mostly uses his chains and some fire magic. I used to think this was kind of lame because Kratos is giving everything he's got and Spawn is just casually no-selling it, but they didn't make it look as one-sided as I remembered. When Spawn starts doing his rush combos, they actually do look pretty decent, if not for the season one jank. But then you have moments like this where Kratos is being an idiot who charges his arrow for way too long for no reason, causing him to catch fire. And although it's implied that Spawn was lighting the arrow on fire, why wasn't Kratos firing the arrow in the first place? At least it leads to the cool shot of Kratos jumping out of the fire and finally dealing some damage with the Sword of Olympus, and then you have him slicing off his chain and finally getting a good killing blow on Spawn, but nope, Spawn teleports behind him, goes and Kratos dies. Yay! 
Conclusion is at least fine. It's weird how they say the sword of Olympus was made in heaven and not Olympus, but oh well, what can you do? Either way, I was impressed with how much I liked this episode. I mean, obviously there's a reason why Kratos specifically is arguably the most requested character to return, as well as Spawn having a bunch of matchups that people really want to see, but still, for an episode like this, it's not bad at all. I'd give it a 70 out of 100. Pretty good. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I really don't understand why this is a matchup. I mean, was there some sort of arcade rivalry between Bomberman and Dig Dug back in the day? I honestly don't know. And this episode did not convince me that the matchup was particularly interesting. I mean, to be fair, Bomberman does have a pretty good analysis. I like the fake out of the Act Zero Bomberman being used as his story, and how they actually contextualize Bomberman getting blown up by his own bombs. That's more of a player thing, but it's just so relatable that you might as well make it a genuine factor of the character. And I do like how Bomberman's end clip is... Leaving behind many smoldering piles of rubble that used to be planets, towns, and families. Wait, did they just put Bomberman at planet level in this episode? What? Dig Dug's analysis is fine. Apparently Taito Hori's name does not actually mean I want to dig, but it's just a pun on that phrase, but eh, semantics, I guess. Not much to talk about, so let's just skip over to the fight. It starts with some attacks from the animal that Bomberman is riding, and then Dig Dug just blows it up and the fight takes place underground. Personally, I don't mind Bomberman's power-ups being hidden in the fight, as they did say that he can find power-ups hidden in the levels, so it makes sense that he'd find more power-ups in the arena they're in. I do think that getting them all at once in this same spot is a little weird, but it doesn't bother me as much as other people. What does bother me is this bomb kick section. <sighs> it just goes on for so long and nothing interesting really happens until, doink, second bomb. That's over. And then you have this bomb charge, which also lasts for too long, but it does blow up the ground and Dig Dug somehow survives a fall that deep despite the analysis portion saying that he cannot actually survive a fall like that. Oh, well, I do like the kill. Dig Dug just briefly inflating him is a more creative way than just blowing him up with his air pump. And then Bomberman dying to his own bomb is really fitting. But aside from that, eh, don't care. 43 out of 100. Pretty dull. <laughs> oh, now we're talking. This is a fan favorite of season one. It's the first death battle episode to have full voice acting, as opposed to just one of the characters having voice clips and the other one being silent. They got Takahata 101 and Nick Landis from Team Four Star in this episode. That is based. I don't even like Dragon Ball, yet I think that's based. That's right, Vegeta can- They were so close to him, that's right, Boomstick, how dare you? It's also funny to see how they used to use game and Archie Sonic composites and didn't think about how busted Archie Sonic is. And also apparently Vegeta only getting a 500% power increase is a nerf and that is actually a 5000% power increase. <laughs> they nerfed Vegeta and he still stomped. Planet level Vegeta versus roughly town level Shadow. Those were the stats they were given. I don't think I like that very much. But anyways, I remember a lot of people saying that this is probably Shadow's best episode. I mean, I guess it depends on the person as to whether or not they think Shadow versus Ryuko is better. Either way, it's also been a long time since I've seen this episode, so let's see if I think that. This whole episode has the vibe of a Dragon Ball abridged episode, which I do like, but I will admit the start is a little rough. Shadow showing off his pixel game while running, as well as some bad pacing in the dialogue. You have just standing around, talking, standing around, keep talking. Vegeta gets a stick combo on Shadow! And then he stands around talking while slowly charging up an attack, and then Shadow slowly slowly turns into Super Shadow. After that, the fight does start to get better, I will admit. Got some cool looking combos. Shadow's chaos powers are well implemented. I like Shadow teleporting Vegeta to other places until he teleports him in space and Vegeta just gets so pissed off that he just punches the moon and Shadow taking off his inhibitor rings to teleport it back into place. That's a cool moment right there. And then Shadow uses a chaos blast and despite the fact that he uses a chaos blast, the episode wants you to think that he never actually used the chaos blast. Okay. I do like how the conclusion was based around if Vegeta could survive Super Shadow. I mean, that's the entire argument, but that is what they needed. Otherwise, this is just an okay episode. I don't think I like it quite as much as other people. I'd only give it about a uh, 66 out of 100. Not great, but it's got a nice charm to it. 
rivalry is legendary and their fame unmatched. You can't get a much more iconic death battle line than that. And I gotta say, for two characters who are otherwise really simple for the most part, these analysis sections were really good and they actually flesh out the characters quite a bit. I appreciate that. It's cool. I do like how they point out Mario is not a strategist, and I like how they talk about all his other power-ups. And as for Sonic's analysis, remember when I brought up the Archie and Game Shadow composites in the previous episode? Not only do they do that here, but they also use this line. After absorbing thousands of power rings during his adventures, Sonic has become an embodiment of chaos. Does this sound familiar to you? By collecting so many rings and emeralds over the years, Sonic has become a literal embodiment of chaos itself. I know that they didn't try to scale this like they did in Flash vs. Sonic, but given how it's the same line almost word for word, I just think that's kind of amusing. Aside from that, Sonic's analysis is also really enjoyable. But enough about that, let's talk about the fight. This fight has actually aged very, very well. Sonic's voice is all right. I mean, it fits the character pretty decently, albeit sounding nothing like any other Sonic voice, but there is a lot to like here. Mario's starting combo looks really well done, and wow, Ben really likes using these dash combos. But for once, it makes perfect sense sense in the context of Sonic the f***ing Hedgehog. Then there is this whole montage thing that does happen too early, but not as early as I remember. You could at least argue that it's fairly close to the middle of the fight. And I do like this bit here. But then they start using their power-ups and... This is what makes this episode so good. It actually feels like they're using every power-up they can. You have Mario's Fire Flower, who uses a Mario Finale, but Sonic instantly responds by just barely pulling out the Fire Shield, who uses some more dash combos on Mario. The Volcano bit is also really cool. Not only does it have the Mario eyes, but it actually looks like a place they'd feasibly go to given the power-ups they're using, with the Lightning Shield and the Cape Feather. The bob -omb bit is a little too slow, but it's a decently charming bit, so I'll allow it. And you also have the Bubble Shield and the Frog Suit, which sadly it's kind of wasted. But then when Super Sonic comes out, Mario's using every single one of his invincibility power-ups. From the Metal Mushroom to the Invincibility Star to even the Mega Mushroom. Really shows how Mario's only chance is needing to outlast Super Sonic. And then the kill is really good. Mario blocks the first attack, but fails to block the others. But then Sonic gets this nice combo and spin dashes on top of his body. Good kill. Now as for the conclusion, I know that it's wrong by its own logic saying that the power-ups perfectly counter each other. They also said that Mario being able to crush castles and Sonic getting nothing for strength. Although I wouldn't say that the Ice Flower and Super Emeralds are comparable, but oh well. This is still a really, really good episode. Unironically, 82 out of 100. Genuinely enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. <laughs> Death Battle vs. The World. This was kind of an interesting episode because despite being the biggest stomp in the show's history with boundless death battle versus a, uh, what, a uh, multi-continental world or something? I don't know, this was a massive stomp, but I like how they made it last one second longer to make it look like less of a stomp. And then you realize that this entire episode was just an advertisement for death battle shirts and, um... Ugh, fine, I'll talk about the mistake. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This episode gets a zero out of 100 by virtue of existing, but I'm gonna give this episode a legitimate review, I guess. It's no secret that this episode is considered to be, well, cyberbullying. And the fact that this is still one of the most viewed episodes of the show kind of pisses me off, not gonna lie. But since no one else has given this episode a proper rundown, at least to my knowledge, I'll try to do the best I can. They say that Justin Bieber suddenly got his talent, but dude, even I knew that JB was playing music long before he got a career in it. What the f*** are y'all talking about, and why are you saying it? It's also kind of surreal saying that this is the most viewed video of all time, when that is clearly not the case anymore. Also, can no longer properly sing due to puberty? You are such a terrific dumbass! Okay, I'll admit, the lock of hair bit was kind of funny, but that's just something ridiculous in celebrity culture, so of course it's funny. Oh, but the next bit, oof. Talking about his fear of thrown objects is one thing, but using his aggressive side as an actual versus stat? That's kind of f***ed up! Especially since it does tap into some of the physical attacks he's done in real life. Also, the end clip is Justin Bieber getting shot a bunch of times. Feel better? <laughs> yep. Classy. But hey, that wasn't that bad. I mean, it was, but for the sake of maintaining a tone, let's pretend that it wasn't. Before I show you a single frame of Rebecca Black's analysis in this episode, I just want to point out a few things. Rebecca was being manipulated by her music producer. 
She was getting bullied at school, let alone the internet, as well as the community she lived in. She even begged her mom to switch to homeschool because of all of this harassment. She was also put on Good Morning America, where the interviewer forcefully read mean comments right in front of her and asked Rebecca to read them out loud herself. Keep all of this in mind as we discuss Rebecca Black's analysis. She seems to have an extreme case of ADHD. She is also incredibly indecisive. She cannot focus on one thing for very long. But like a normal person, when she finally makes up her mind, she makes the worst possible choice. Yep, I think we can move on here. <laughs> wow! Ben did mention that he was trying to analyze him from how Rebecca was being portrayed in her own music video. Okay, doesn't change the fact that you know jack sh** about this person in real life. <laughs> so, you're still judging this person as if you know her at all. You clown! <laughs> this is terrible, huh? Wow. Okay, I, I, I'm actually, I'm actually just walking around aimlessly away from my microphone because I have no <laughs> I have no words! And yes, I'm gonna make you sit through all of this with a blank screen, and you are gonna be okay with it! Baby face. So as for the fight, these sprites look hideous. They just Photoshop random images of their heads, and then just slap it onto some Scott Pilgrim sprites. <laughs> the only funny bit is that Boomstick says he scattered weapons all over the arena. Just to make it more interesting. But weapons or not, this is still just shitty arm movements, the OVA. It's not even a fight. I mean, time basically freezes for 13 seconds, and then Rebecca just hops on the car and everyone dies. Yes, everyone. Not just the two combatants, but the kid that was driving, the Jonas Brothers, and fucking Miley Cyrus? What did they have to do with this episode? What the hell did any of these people ever do to you aside from nothing bad in the history? history of ever. And then the conclusion is just leave a comment on who you think sucked the most. Um, okay, okay. Even if we pretend that these are two fictional characters and that this is somehow not cyberbullying, the best score I can give it is an 11 out of 100. Like I said, it's just shitty arm movements, the OVA. Not to mention that this episode features the two worst analysis portions of the entire show back to back. They're so bad that even if JB and RB were fictional characters, none of these jokes would fly by me. Look, I'm not trying to take a moral high ground or anything. Back in the day, I was making jokes about these two as well. Hell, I even used to think this episode was funny when I first watched it as a kid. I'm just trying to say that out of all the cases of early 2010s humor, this is easily the worst one in my book. It's one thing to use slurs as a means of insulting a fictional character, but seeing two grown-ass men dedicate an entire episode of their web show to having personifications of two real-life teenagers dying a horrible bloody death? That's a big yikes in my book. I know that this is a joke episode, but even if you remove all of the very gross implications, there's only one joke they tell throughout the entire episode, and it's EW POP STARS! At least with Goomba vs Koopa, while the main joke was LO THESE TWO ENEMIES ARE SO DUMB, they at least had other jokes like YO I DIDN'T KNOW THESE TWO COULD FIGHT! Or HOW THE HECK IS THAT GOOMBA HOLDING A BAT?! Whereas here's just the same joke throughout both analysis portions, and even the fight and conclusion. These are grown-ups with jobs and careers. They shouldn't let two teenage pop stars annoy the hell out of them to this degree. Yeah, in case it wasn't obvious, I think that this is the biggest L of Death Battle's entire history. Not only have many of other people far more important than me spoken out about how terrible this episode is, but even Ben Singer openly dislikes this episode, calling it the dumbest death battle idea that they've ever done. So with that in mind, it means that it's impossible for any death battle episode to be worse than this. So let's move on to a better death battle episode. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm just gonna have to take what I can get. Sure, why not? Every generation has idolized a sci-fi hero. Hang on, did they just say that Harry Potter is a sci-fi hero? What? Though apparently they were gonna do Aang versus Harry, which honestly makes slightly more sense. But their reason for not doing it was that it's a stomp. As if Luke Skywalker wasn't an even bigger stomp. 
<laughs> Whatever, man. The analysis is weird. There's some random penis joke that I don't quite understand why it's there. Boomstick failing to summon loose women fails. Why would you fit a horny boomstick joke here of all places? With Harry's analysis, as someone who finally understands why his older siblings love the Harry Potter series so much, this analysis is kind of boring. Doesn't really tie into any interesting tidbits of its character or storyline. Doesn't really make Hogwarts look that interesting. It's just kind of there. The end clip is decently funny though, I guess. The one point that did stand out to me was that Harry has never used Avada Kedavra in an actual fight. Avada Kedavra! Avada Kedavra! Avada Kedavra! Why is Harry the only one talking when Luke can also speak? What is with this animation here? What is with this animation here? Why does this look weird? Ugh. I just don't like the look of this. I will admit the scar bit is just as good as I remember. Cool visuals, amazing death scream. Why was that not the kill? And it's also weird that the scar isn't even mentioned until that moment and like one time in the conclusion. This episode's really bad. 38 out of 100. Give me Luke versus Paul Atreides and Harry Potter versus Edward Elric. Thank you very much. Yep, we got another case of early 2010s humor. Horny Boomstick is just as unfunny as it's ever been. And they also have their measurements in the analysis, but for some reason, chun Li's is laughably smaller than Mai's, and that's not even true? <laughs> also, she wears it for Kunoichi, a female ninja method of centrally distracting the foe before striking. No, that is not what a kunoichi is. Kunoichi is literally just a female ninja. Though I will admit there is some good stuff. I like how they go over Chun-Li's history with Bison and Gen, but that's the best I can say about the analysis. I also think it's really weird how they bring up uh, how Chun-Li needs to be saved by Guile a lot, and how Mai needs to be saved by Andy a lot, when that barely ever happened. In fact, if I'm correct, the only time where Chun-Li was ever saved by Guile was in like the Street Fighter 2 series, I think, or like movie. So I don't get why it's here. Also, I guess the Chun-Li gun joke is kind of a functional joke. I mean, literally everyone in the history of ever has made that joke at least once in their lives, but I'm really trying to find as much as I can in the analysis portions because I don't want to talk about the fight, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I just brought it up. Come on, you're not gonna have them start off with their unique intro from Capcom vs. SNK2? Oh. A lot of this is just a bunch of boring ass combos. Yeah, that's kind of a running theme with these early season one episodes. Hmm. I like the wall jump section, even though the background just randomly disappears for no reason. Chun-Li using her spinning bird kick like a DP, when her actual DP is Ten Shokyak, which is completely left out of the episode for some reason. The death is okay, albeit kind of abrupt. I like how Mai uses it as a fake out super counter to Chun's super. The skeleton completely clashes with the sprites, but I guess that's fine. And as for the conclusion... Chun-Li may be a bit tougher and quicker than Mai. That's because you didn't give Mai anything! Yeah, once again, not much to say. 32 out of 100. <laughs> oh no. Not this episode. Not the one where they were so afraid to alienate My Little Pony fans if they had any chance of Rainbow Dash losing, only to just have no issue seeing childhood characters getting brutally murdered, or... <laughs> His poor knowledge of human society led him to forget to pull up the girls. Ah! It's actually a lot worse than I remember, oh my... Mm. The analyses are really annoying. Starscreams is literally just describing how much of an idiot he is. Yeah, they say he's a transformer and he has guns and... You can transform into a plane, but that's about it. I mean, it's kind of in bad taste when they just do nothing but make fun of his short-lived victories and his ending clip being Megatron calling him an idiot. And as for Rainbow Dash, I mean, do you want to hear Boomstick doing nothing but groaning and saying, It's a pony! How does it do that? I mean, at least Boomstick does come around and saying, Wow, Rainbow Dash is actually pretty cool. And as for the fight, hmm. So anyways, when Death Battle disrespects a character, this is exactly what it looks like. Although, not in the way that you've heard other people bring up. I can ignore Rainbow Dash just pissing him off throughout the entire animation, and I can even ignore this bit where she's just making faces at Starscream's radar. I could buy that some of these interactions could happen if they met in person, 
but what I can't defend are the multiple moments where Starscream is literally just standing around and letting Rainbow Dash hit him. You could at least have him talk and saying, STAND STILL I'M TRYING TO HIT YOU! Which they do like one time. But they have Starscream just standing around, turning around, actually not even turning around, just literally flipping his sprite back and forth TWICE! twice. Why are you doing this? I know that this was supposed to be a joke episode because AH MY LITTLE PONY CAN BE TRANSFORMERS! What if I just did an entire video with that voice? <laughs> but the multi does is just land two attacks and act really confused as to why he's losing. I mean, I get that G1 Starscream is probably the kind of character who thinks he's too big for his britches, but this is just flanderization! There's only one good bit in the entire episode, and it's where Starscream is using his silver tongue to distract Rainbow Dash. It's genuinely a really cool moment. It has some funny visual gags, it's a nice character moment used as an advantage, and Rainbow Dash would realistically believe him at first. At least he's able to fire his weapons before she actually moves. But then the ending happens and... <coughs> okay, sure. And the conclusion is basically nothing. They gave nothing for stats, they gave nothing for skills. I guess the most they said was that uh, Rainbow Dash was fast enough to break the sound barrier. But yeah, Starscream got done hella dirty. 26 out of 100. Starscream versus Metal Face when? Also, Erica Mendez was in this episode, what? <laughs> oh, this episode. The one that a lot of people want to see remastered. To a point where this is probably the most requested rematch as of this moment. With the only rematches more popular than this were the ones that have already happened. But like with most of season 1, it's been a long time since I've seen this, so I was interested to revisit this. And come to my surprise, these analysis portions were actually really engaging. This was the first time where Ben tried his best to make the analysis scripts as engaging as possible, as opposed to some previous analysis portions like in Kratos vs Spawn where he felt like he was just reading off of a Wikipedia article. And while I did like those analysis portions, I can agree they did drag on a bit. But that's not the case here. I think the writing efforts he made paid off pretty well. I thought it was interesting learning about these characters as well as their weapons, armors, and skills. And that's just for Chief's analysis. I actually liked Doomguy's analysis a lot more. Boomstick drooling over Doomguy's various weapons was genuinely pretty endearing and kind of funny at times. This is the kind of horny Boomstick I wish we saw more often in this season. I also like the big f***ing gun bit, as apparently that's the name of the weapon. <laughs> <laughs> and I also like the other weapon where Wiz is hyping it up as something and Boomstick is getting very, very excited only for Wiz to say It's basically useless against anything that isn't from hell. Damn it! That's a good bit. But as for the fight, this is the first FPS themed episode and so far the only one. Which means that Chief and Doomguy have to be shooting each other on a 2D plane. So there's not a lot of room for dynamic shots. And with that in mind, I can totally see why people would want a rematch of this episode. However, there's still some pretty cool shots here and there. Chief catching the missile and throwing it back was cool, even if it's dumb that he dodged the first two missiles by st and then you have Chief yeeting the car upwards to distract Doomguy during an attempted sneak attack, only for Doomguy to catch onto it. But the death, however, it's kind of a mixed bag. On the one hand, the scream was decently comical and the teabag bit was also kind of cute. But on the other hand, Chief literally got blown up before he put up the bubble shield, but... Okay, and as for the conclusion, it's rushed, but this is actually the first time they put up the conclusion panels that would be used for the rest of the season, and would even be brought back in season 9. But yeah, just an overall okay episode, and arguably the one that is most impacted by sprite animations, at least out of season 1. 61 out of 100. A remaster would be kinda cool, I'll admit. <laughs> Eggman vs. Wily was the first episode on the Screw Attack website, as opposed to Revision 3, rest in peace, and is also the last episode solely animated by Ben. Which, by the way, he admits that an episode like this was impossible, but that's the point, because he did this whole thing by himself just to make a point that, hey, we need more people working on this! <laughs> That is a certified based Ben moment right there. <laughs> That's kind of raw. Thankfully, he was able to do it with, um, I, I want to say, uh, some ease, but I'm pretty sure this wasn't easy to make by himself. But it could have been a lot harder on him because he was able to start working on this episode right when he just finished his college semester at the time. Still, imagine doing an entire project by yourself just to make a point that you need more people helping with the show. 
I'm still not over that. I actually just found that out right as I'm recording this. But yeah, for this one, not only did you have Eggman and Wily and their various mechs and inventions, but also their bad nicks and higher tiered robots. That's what makes these analysis portions unique in that they treat every single robot as if it was a unique combatant. I mean, obviously they don't dwell on them for too long, cause for the most part there is not a whole lot to them, but they still got their own sections in the side panels, they cover some feats that they've done, they go over their abilities and weapons very well, it's a good time! I also like how they recontextualize Eggman's downfalls as a result in overlooking some major points rather than the whole Eggman has an IQ of 300 yet he's a complete idiot shenanigan that I still hear all the f***ing time. For being the last episode you animate by yourself, obviously it has its flaws but it still has a lot going for it. It starts off with basic troops with Wily winning to prove the fact that his fodder enemies are at least better built. But then Eggman starts sending in his stronger robots to turn the tide, shoutouts to Beta's appearance in particular. And then you start to see all these other robots and they're all shooting all these projectiles at each other, constantly going back and forth. It's really cool. Poor Mecha Knuckles though, he only gets like two seconds of screen time and that's when he's dying. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, every other robot feels like they get a dramatic appearance. Be it through a unique scene, the robot taking down another robot, or getting a dramatic appearance. I really wrote that in twice? Seriously? I also like how they utilize Silver Sonic. They bring up how he's being powered by a Chaos Emerald, and then in the fight you have Metal Sonic using the Chaos Emerald as his own advantage after Silver Sonic gets destroyed. Oh, and the Scratching Grounder vs. Sheet Man bit is peak and I will not hear otherwise. One other issue I do have is that the Egg Fleet doesn't get any screen time, which is kind of disappointing given how big of a deal he makes it. Actually, now that I brought it up, the voice acting is kind of a mixed bag. Caden Red Pearl's Eggman is pretty good, and his single line as Metal Sonic is great, but how come Wily doesn't have a voice actor? I mean, I'm sure that there's at least a clip of his laugh you could have used at least a couple times in the episode. Oh well. There is the ending which a lot of people don't like, and it's for pretty valid reasons. I mean, you had this great fight that genuinely looked like it could go either way, with some robots showing superiority to others, but then Metal Sonic just kills everyone, and that's the ending they go with. They also say that Slash Man was built to destroy asteroids, and they didn't give Metal Sonic anything power or durability wise, just saying he was fast. I mean, I guess there is a whole Napalm Man blowing up his own museum, but I think it's safe to say that Metal Overlord is bigger than a museum. I doubt he's bigger than an asteroid, though! Damn, we actually could have gotten a raw moment where Slash Man just kills Metal Sonic with a single slash. <laughs> I mean, this is following their logic, so, uh, whatever. In all seriousness, this was a very ambitious episode that definitely paid off. It does have the typical season one jank, but at the same time, we're talking season one while Ben was doing all the animating himself, so... With that in mind, 83 out of 100. Still a great episode, and there's literally nothing else like it. I would like to see this episode done again some way. <laughs> Peach vs. Zelda was the first episode where Ben finally got some help in the animation department, being animated by Jordan Lange, who would be their go-to animator up until Ivy vs. Orchid. And this is where I start to hold Death Battle to a higher standard now that they actually have an animation team. But Ben still wrote the analysis sections though, so how do those fare? Well, in Zelda's analysis, I noticed there was a bit of compositing characters. I mean, Zelda is being described as stubborn and feisty when not every version of Zelda is. This is mostly a minor thing, and you could argue that the compositing problem hurt the Ninja Turtles episodes a lot more. But here, even though I'm not too familiar with the Zelda games, I do know for a fact that each version of Zelda is noticeably different in terms of both appearance and personality. So that one kind of stuck out to me. Aside from from that, not much to complain about. And there's also this joke here. Spirits. Like booze? That's obviously an indirect joke, but it kind of made me laugh. So yeah, Zelda's analysis, not too bad. Peach's analysis, however. Ugh. This analysis is kind of painful, not gonna lie. Half of Peach's analysis is just Boomstick laughing, and the other half is just LOL, she gets kidnapped, she laid into Bowser, just put out already! Sex joke, sex joke, sex joke! I mean, to be fair, you did have Wiz trying to be respectful to her, but there are other moments like Boomstick trying to make a joke about how Peach pulls turnips out of a very inappropriate spot, when you can literally see her pulling them out of the ground? Why are you turning it into a sex joke? This is not a fun analysis to get through. It's actually just as bad as both Rogue and Wonder Woman's analyses from earlier in the season. Although to be fair, you didn't have Boomstick saying anything about like when Daisy's unconscious or whatever the f**k. 
At least the fight's pretty good, though. Minus the hideous-looking Zelda sprites. There are other moments, such as Peach's quirky powers playing off of Zelda's straightforward powers. Like how Zelda starts shooting fireballs, and Peach's solution is to just chuck some turnips at the fireballs. And there's also the slap fight, which is actually kind of funny, I'll admit. It's got good timing, it gets even crazier with the rainbows and the hearts. And this is actually something that I've noticed about a lot of Jordan Lange's animations. He likes to animate all these fast-paced beatdowns. Trust me when I say you're gonna find at least one of them in his other episodes, Sprite or 3D. Either way, this is one of my favorite fast-paced beatdowns he's done. And then you have Peach unleashing her rage, and then Zelda shooting a light arrow and destroying the bridge in the process. Man, the bridge's destruction actually has a lot of impact. And the aerial fight that happens right afterwards? Yeah, I, I like this a lot. And then they heal themselves up, followed by them attacking each other some more. And the falling sheep bit, I do like the touch of how the sheep falls in a very similar position to where Peach was already standing when she hit it earlier in the episode. And then it leads into the kill, which... Did I win? Yeah, it's a good kill. And then on to the conclusion, it's fine. Some people have issues with the whole PSI thing. Ben does too, so no one's alone on that. But what's funny is that you didn't even need to use these PSI numbers to justify Peach being stronger. Because at the end of the day, this is coming from a character who is effortlessly able to just break bricks with her fists. Other than that, it's a fine conclusion. And it doesn't change the fact that this episode definitely has a lot to love about it. But man, <laughs> Peach's analysis honestly brings it way down for me. And given that this this episode is where I start to hold Death Battle to a higher standard. It's genuinely gonna go from something like a, say, 84 to a 71. Oof, that's a big drop. Still a good episode. <laughs> Thor vs. Raiden, aka the biggest stomp of season one, <laughs> both by their logic and in general. <laughs> And it's an even bigger stomp now! Sheesh. It's like Boomstick would say in Season 4. Why did we put this guy up against Raiden again? I yeah, hate to see it. Either way, the analysis sections were kind of boring. I mean, they ran down both characters fine, but this was the whole Wikipedia article that Ben was talking about with Kratos vs. Spawn. But the fight, however? Let's see how it stacks up. You actually have some really cool moments like Raiden redirecting Thor's lightning, turning it from yellow to blue, which actually gives us a pretty neat distinction between the two characters. I'm a sucker for unique color trails like this, so this is right down my alley. But then you have some ridiculous moments like Thor just punching a tree at Raiden after uprooting it, and then just causing a MIGHTY TORNADO! Yeah, yeah, this this section is actually pretty fun. It's easily the best part of the animation, because this is the one time that Thor hits Raiden with his hammer, and then there's the whole throwing him into the sun bit with the whole <laughs> quote, <laughs> and then Raiden fucking dies. Holy sh**, this was a glorious death, for real. Aside from that, there are a couple issues that I have. I think that Raiden's charge takes a little too long, and then there's this weird part where Thor gets a beatdown on Raiden and then randomly retreats after getting a combo on him? Oh well, this is a solid episode. 79 out of 100, too much lightning. The first 3D episode of Death Battle ever! And Ben didn't even know it was 3D until like two days before the episode. You hate to say it. But seriously though, this episode actually has something interesting to talk about. When people say that Death Battle is wrong, they almost always go for a season one or season two episode. I mean, you're allowed to say the conclusions are wrong. I do that all the time. I mean, have you not been paying attention to how I've been criticizing some of these episodes? You gotta keep in mind that versus debating back then wasn't nearly as accessible as it is now. Nowadays, you have all sorts of discords where you can ask people how strong a character is. There's also versus battle battles, as well as other versus debating sites, there are the G1 blogs. But back then, there was almost nothing. And Ben was in a difficult position, because how are you going to translate traditional stats to a character from a turn-based RPG? This also caused an issue with the fourth rule of death battle. It basically implied that everything a character has was on the table, including non-canon material. What am I saying by this? The only equipment they were allowed to use were from their respective fighting games, meaning Super Smash Bros. and Dissidia. But here's the loophole. Not only was Link allowed to use his bombs, boomerangs, hookshots, bows, and arrows, but the variations of them as well, most notably his light, ice, and fire arrows. On top of that, he was technically allowed to use his speedy boots and his iron boots as well, whereas Cloud was only allowed to use the limit breaks and materia from the Dissidia games. And skipping ahead to the conclusion, one of their main arguments was that Link's varied arsenal was going to overwhelm Cloud, and when you limit their arsenal to this degree, no duh. 
I'll get to this episode when I cover season 8, but in Link vs. Cloud 2, letting them use their entire canon arsenal not only allowed for a more fair judgment on who would win, but also led to some unique interactions in their abilities as well. So yeah, this is one of those episodes where you can say is wrong overall, and you actually have an interesting case to make. In terms of analyzing the characters outside of their arsenals, I did like the running joke of Boomstick mistaking Link for a fairy and like trying to prove it. Cloud's analysis isn't bad, but it does have a couple weird bits, like Cloud's limit breaks being powered by emotions? What? Summons are considered outside help? What? Yeah, I think people are right to hate on season one, not gonna lie, Wiz. But then we have the animation, the actual fight itself, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, this is very rough. Neither character tends to move their core body during their sword swings, and there are a couple of infamously jank animations here. But there are a couple of interesting bits. Link jumping off the pillar and doing the spin attack is really good. I like how the lock-on reticle during the Omni Slash is kind of fuzzy at first. I mean, originally I thought that this was just the sprites being weird, but no, they made it blurry on purpose. Good stuff right there. But then you have other moments like Link just putting away his shield and letting Cloud wail at him. And then other moments like the hook shot very slowly reaching for his Master Sword again. Yeah, there's clearly a lot to this fight that doesn't work. All leading up to a pretty underwhelming death where Cloud just decides to crouch down for no reason and let the bombs hit him. I mean, I guess the whole ending blow is fine, but then we get uh, this moment right here. And that's how the fight ends. Not even a death, really. On oh, the conclusion, what was something that they said in Cloud's analysis? Cloud's single-handedly taken down quite a few powerhouses, like the giant Bahamut Sin and planet-busting Sephiroth. And what are they trying to say in the conclusion? Cloud may be powerful, but Link's golden gauntlets were stronger. Planet-busting Sephiroth. Link can withstand over a thousand tons of pressure, surviving any of Cloud's assaults. Planet-busting Sephiroth. Not to mention his items helped him match Cloud's superhuman- Planet-busting Sephiroth. I don't mind if an episode is wrong overall, because first of all, that's subjective, and second of all, if you're gonna try to prove a case for a character winning, the least you should do is make sure your case adds up. You can't just say that Link lifting a boulder is strong than Cloud fighting the planet-busting Sephiroth. That's not how anything works. But yeah, that's all I got, so... Actually, there is one more moment in the animation I forgot to talk about. This... This is weird... It's all so funny, but it's worse than what I feel... This... Has me real dead... So I'll give it 53 out of 100... Yeah, it's got a roll, but baby doesn't matter all that much. I'd argue no. I still think about how everyone at my school would get triggered whenever I tell them that Spider-Man beats Batman. Hell, I'd even show them this episode and they still think it's bullshit. I mean, you have peak human versus superhuman. Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> ah well, ah well. Batman vs. Spider-Man, the first of many, many Batman episodes. Cause Death Battle just likes using them that much, apparently. Batman's analysis is pretty good. It covers his backstory, it covers his abilities. I like everything here. Ending clip is kinda rad. Spider-Man's analysis is kinda weird. On the one hand, you have pretty decent jokes, like the superhero with no friends bit, and the Justice League bit, even if that's apparently fan art and not an official cover. But on the other hand, you also have things like the web shooting gag, which is just cringeworthy, and it goes on for way too long. The whole one girlfriend joke is kind of gross, though I will say, more girlfriends than any other superhero. <laughs> Alright, fair enough. Now, as far as season one goes, this one's a fan favorite, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's not for me. It's not a bad episode. It just doesn't age as well as I would have wanted it to. I mean, you do have moments like Spider-Man constantly getting hit by bombs and caught off guard by them, despite the fact that he has a spider sense. I mean, I guess for one case, he's at least trapped in rope, and you could argue that Spider-Man's cockiness allows him to just choose not to dodge the bomb, but eh, I don't like the way it was written. I mean, I guess the bats crashing through the window was kind of cool though. Another moment was how Batman used a batarang to smash the lights off, making it dark, but he was still able to see Spider-Man because of his bright colored costume, but Spider-Man is still able to dodge it with his spider sense, I guess? I don't know. This episode is really nothing special, at least until the death, which, it's great. This is the one part of the episode where I can say is just as amazing as everyone hypes it up to be. Even if Spider-Man's- Sorry about that. Is- unintentionally funny. Ah, the charm of using Marvel vs. Capcom voice clips in the wrong context. 
And the conclusion is pretty good. This was a struggle that Ben had about bringing Batman onto Death Battle because the running joke is that Batman can beat anyone with prep time. But the nature of Death Battle doesn't allow Batman to use his prep time because no one's allowed to have prep time. It's kind of been an unspoken rule ever since at least this episode. Unless if you want to argue that it ties into the rule of how no characters are allowed to have any prior knowledge of each other unless it's otherwise specified. They also tried to counter that by saying that if we give Batman prep time, we'd have to give Spider-Man that same amount of prep time. But aside from that, I can't say that anything about this episode really stuck out to me, apart from a moment that I find to be kind of weird. It's an okay episode. Definitely not bad, just not one that sticks with me as much as I would like. 66 out of 100. Is that a fair score? Because I think that's a fair score. Interesting how they use Ash's Pikachu from the anime for this death battle as opposed to just a generic Pikachu from the Pokemon games. Not to mention that Blanc is one of my favorite Street Fighter characters, so his analysis intrigued me by association. Aside from that, the analysis don't have a lot to talk about beyond Megaton Warhead Pikachu and nothing Blanca. <laughs> So let's just move on to the fight. I think that this beatdown looks kind of weird at first, but admittedly Pikachu's speed is conveyed really well. The dynamic being based around lightning and charging attacks is pretty fitting. This beatdown kind of proves that there's not a lot to work with in terms of physical attacks, but as far as unique abilities go, they do play off of each other pretty well. About as well as you would expect with a dynamic like this. This lightning cannonball versus bolt tackle struggle is really good, has a lot of impact and anticipation, and then the death happens. <laughs> We can't have Starscream kill a pony. Oh, but we still can't have Starscream killing a pony. Um, um, we can't have Starscream kill a pony. What's your excuse now, buddy? This was an extremely close match. Okay, imagine taking Pokemon types seriously in verses. Even Ben says that was dumb. But yeah, not much to say with this episode. 56 out of 100. The next episode, however... The season 1 finale. The episode that was explicitly saved as the 25th episode milestone. The episode that Ben has actually been overworking himself on just to get right since Mario vs Sonic. The episode that featured two abridged voice actors, Masako X from Team 4 Star and It's Just Some Random Guy from the I'm a Marvel and I'm a DC series of videos from back in the day. This episode is one of, if not THE longest death battle episode ever. Clocking in at a whopping 32 minutes, which is longer than a lot of episodes released nowadays. And as of January 10th, 2023, Goku vs Superman is officially 10 years old. So what better day to upload the first part of this ranking retrospective series than on the same day that this episode was published onto YouTube. After re-watching this episode for the first time after a few years, oh, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm gonna take that sugar and use it to bake the most delicious cake I can! Because this is easily the most amount of passion ever put into a death battle. Yes, this episode has season 1 jank. Yes, the numbers are laughably bad and wrong. Yes, there is absolutely more to cover for both characters. And if any of that matters to you, that's fine. But speaking as someone who grew up with this series, it does not matter to me in the slightest. In fact, I'm just gonna give the score right now. 94 out of 100. Let's see why I'm giving this episode episode such a high score. Goku's analysis shows the type of standards that they're holding themselves to. Pointing out any and all mistranslations cover the differences between Ki and magic, they explain what his transformations and powers do, they fully explore Goku's history and what he stands for as a character, and they even correct a few other misconceptions such as the one about instant transmission. And the end clip uses that iconic ally to good nightmare to you line which apparently contradicts with this character. Though to be fair they did cover this up in the sequel. And as for Superman's analysis, I'll admit it's not as good as Goku's as they do poke fun a little more than what I remember, but at the end of the day, they still cover his powers, feats, and story extremely well, even citing a few other sources to help determine it. Oh, and uh, would you believe me if I said that this episode was originally going to be 20 minutes longer just because of the amount of stuff they had to work with to determine the conclusion? Because this episode was originally going to be 20 minutes longer, but they had to cut it all out so that the episode was at a watchable length, which is even crazier when you remember that 32 minutes is still longer than most if not every death battle episode, period. But on to the fight, and okay, 
I'm gonna be real with you here. I've been using bullet points for the previous episodes and just kind of ad libbing from there. But for this one, since the episode is officially 10 years old, the fight deserves a fully scripted rundown. I just need to make sure I have everything I want to say about this episode. I will admit the abridged section isn't that funny. Superman's is pretty straightforward, albeit kind of weird given some of the stuff he's saying with the lips. But, eh. The Dragon Ball bridge bit is alright, at least once we get to Goku. The whole underwear chafing theme is kind of cringe. The transforming hedgehog is a neat reference, but kind of forced. But then we have Goku saying that he finally found somebody as strong as him, and Vegeta saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> That got a smile out of me. Then Roshi points out that he's an alien, and Goku goes over to fight him and stop him from destroying the planet. This is something I really like about the setup. They make Goku's motive based around his desire to fight someone stronger, but also adding a second ulterior motive that adds a setup that feels really natural. Superman is weirded out, but he's willing to fight anyway, because he's kind of accepted the fact that Goku is just gonna keep trying to fight him no matter what. Then we get the fight announcement. We get some of the trademark Jordan Lange rushdown attacks. We also get a visible difference in fighting styles where Goku is relying on blitzing speeds and teleportation, and Superman is relying more on powerful blows, emphasized by a subtle ripple effect and some good sound design. Of course, Superman gets some rushdown attacks of his own, and he shows no issue in keeping up with Goku's speed, dodging his key barrage and running circles around him when attacking with pressure points. And then what follows is- Ah, Sensu Bean. Want one? No. Okay, I'll admit this part always makes me laugh. That's comedy gold right there. But this leads into Goku's first transformation into Super Saiyan. This shot of Goku blocking Superman's attack to reveal his stronger form and finally landing a powerful blow. There's no ripple effect on Goku's punches, and that's to emphasize how Goku needs to rely on Kaioken and his super forms to keep up in any way. Then we get a good Kamehameha scene with a well-delivered scream and an impactful blast that not only hits Superman, but also destroys the LexCorp building. Oh, LexCorp? Funny how this is what leads into the kryptonite scene. I mean, Lex is always making things with kryptonite, so it makes perfect sense that it be left in the remains. Nice touch! Goku's about to go for another attack, but notices that Superman isn't moving, so he destroys the kryptonite and says that he wants to beat him at his best. Great character moment right there. After that scene, we get back to the fight. There are some more rushdown attacks, this time with Goku getting the upper hand. Then he runs circles around Superman, who seems completely unfazed as he just casually walks up and punches him out. Superman then sneaks up on Goku by smashing a car on him. Okay. At least it leads to a campy pun. Goku transforms into Super Saiyan 2 and yeah, this is the weakest transformation scene of the episode. It's not bad, it's just very standard compared to what we've gotten before and what we'll get later. But now we get to see Superman's heat vision being used to dissipate Goku's key barrage. Then he hits Goku with a lamppost who responds with a power pull combo and extends it. Superman points out that the pole is made of magic, showcasing a moment of Goku being able to take advantage of one of his weaknesses, albeit for a time. And this is the moment where Superman finally starts to take the fight more seriously, where he zooms up to the sky and another part of the planet, which just so happens to be a Dragon Ball styled landscape. I used to find it weird that Superman just runs away during the fight, but I'd like to point out another attention to detail in this episode. Remember the scene where Goku blows up the LexCorp building? You notice that Superman has not been doing that? I mean, yeah, he does punch Goku through a few buildings, and he does attack him with a lamppost and someone else's car, but even then, he's dealing as little damage to the city as he can, whereas Goku isn't shown to have much issue punching through even more buildings or even blowing them up. Not to mention that Superman has been pretty casual throughout the fight up to this point, with it's just some random guy, who I'm gonna refer to as Michael, delivering a confident yet calm demeanor in his voice, and with his animations looking more casual for the most part. But now that he's finally starting to take the fight more seriously, emphasized by Michael's more menacing deliveries, he's moving the fight to a new location as far away from the city as possible, not just because his overwhelming power would easily destroy it, but also because he knows that Goku would be fast enough to catch up to him. And he still gets caught off guard by Goku's instant transmission! What follows is Superman yeeting the power pole away so that Goku can no longer use it in battle, forcing Goku to transform into Super Saiyan 3, with a few light effects and a great scream from Masako. Then Goku gets another beatdown with some decently satisfying looking spin kicks before teleporting him and spinning him on the floor and crashes him into a mountain. Goku notices that he's running out of super forms and tries to read his mind, which Superman claps back with a well-delivered line and a combo that launches Goku back on the ground, causing a crater. And then Goku uses a solar flare before it's revealed that it didn't actually do anything. My turn. The area begins to distort, but as it turns out, this was not Superman's doing. This was Goku powering up into Super Saiyan 4. 
Not only is this the best transformation of the episode, but unironically one of the best transformation scenes of the entire show. The reality distortions, the music, the jarring shift in Masako's voice, even Superman's quirky one-liner being delivered with a sense of feeling impressed. They clash a few hits and suddenly burst into blinding speed, with Goku literally breaking out of it, and Superman using his ice breath to slow him down. But Goku is struggling to get out and then BOOM! Does a combo that launches him upwards with a... A horizontal kick? I get that it's supposed to be a sweep kick, but given that he's technically floating in the air, I don't get that impression at all. Regardless, we finally get to see Superman struggling against Goku. He tries to get to the sun, but Goku chases him down with another Kamehameha. Superman responds with another strong blast from his heat vision, leading to a glorious looking beam struggle with colors that are decently different. Goku's giving off a dark pinkish hue, and Superman's being a lot more scarlet. Ultimately, Goku wins the beam struggle, and that struggle was so big that it uses up all all of Goku's power and is forced to revert back to base form. But it's not over. Goku notices that Superman is taking a sun bath and uses the sun power to restore his energy. It's a nice break from the rest of the fight that also showcases a similarity between the two and how they're able to restore their energy via suns and stars. The music builds up to yet another beam attack where Goku attacks with the energy he gained from the sun, his Super Saiyan aura eventually eclipsing the sun and blasting a beam with an amplified Kamehameha sound effect. Superman flies right through it and drags him to the center of the earth. Ooh, those effects look so so gorgeous! And then Goku's able to power up into Super Saiyan 4 and both deliver their strongest attack. This leads to the music and sound effects being cut off completely, making the impact of the planet blowing up that much more impactful and jarring. Masako gives out a good death scream and Superman is completely knocked out, but he's still able to just barely open his eyes. Very slowly, but he still opens them. What follows is the first outro clip of the series, which would be included in almost every episode up until around season 4. But in this one, knowing that the planet he has sworn to protect is destroyed, he just flies away, finding a way to restore it or maybe even find a new planet to protect. What follows is the conclusion. Yeah, it's a very flawed and outdated conclusion, using some very old numbers. I mean, who knew? Flawed and outdated research is flawed and outdated. But still, they put a lot of work into this conclusion. It goes in-depth directly separating the character's power, lifting strength, durability, and speed. In any other episode, they just compare them simultaneously. But here they distinguish them separately. They also go over various factors and why certain strategies were iffy or just wouldn't work. Goku's stats are definitely determined with a more in-depth approach, however, creating an entirely separate formula just to find those numbers. And going off script for a bit, I highly recommend checking out the Road to 100 blog for this episode specifically. Not only does it add some insight into the episode's production, but it also answers some questions that a lot of people had back in the day, as well as for Goku vs Superman too. Also, I've been using the Road to 100 blog as a source for many episodes in this season, as well as many more episodes that I'll be covering later down the line. I'll leave all the ones I cite in the description. Obviously, we have a much clearer idea of what those numbers would actually be, but keep in mind that this was long before versus debating and calcs became as accessible as they are today. Plus, they say that at the end of the day, those numbers don't matter because they have a perfectly thematic conclusion. Both characters are meant to inspire us, but for different reasons. Goku has the power to break any limits, but Superman has no limits in the first place. You might see this as a no limits fallacy, but they defend it by citing a source that says Superman is as strong as he needs to be. No matter what feats, calcs, or strategies you put into the matchup, the core of their character is what matters most. This is not the best Death Battle episode. I'm definitely gonna cover ones that I like more, but this is certainly Death Battle's magnum opus. There's a good reason why this is by far not just the longest Death Battle episode, but the one with the most views, and a like to dislike ratio that- Oh, right, I forgot about that. Back when this episode was first released, people were not happy with Goku losing, birthing the notorious death battle debunk genre of videos. But keep in mind, the debate back then kept going back and forth, and there were those people who genuinely believed that Goku should have won. They might still be around nowadays, but they're not as prevalent, at least as far as I'm aware. Not everyone was as knowledgeable with the DC comics as they were with the Dragon Ball anime, so the full context of Superman's power wasn't available to everyone on the fly. 
Hell, it wasn't even available to the Death Battle team for some time. Nowadays, people are far more aware of how busted Superman is, but this episode was a huge turnoff for various Dragon Ball fans and even some other people. But that said, even if you think Goku should have won, this is far from the most incorrect Death Battle episode. It's not even the most incorrect of the season. I have a minimum of two hands worth of episodes that I can say are more wrong, by both Death Battle's logic and by the common opinion of versus debaters. Unfitting like to dislike ratio aside, the amount of passion put into this episode cannot be over overstated enough. This isn't just a good episode of Death Battle. This isn't just a masterpiece. This is an iconic relic of early 2010s media. Not bad, Ben. Not bad in the slightest. Anyways, here's my ranking of Season 1 overall. As you can see, I gave a lot of episodes the benefit of the doubt. If I were judging this entire season by the standards I normally give Death Battle, most of these episodes were dropped down by a full tier. These are some rough animations, and making this video was kind of hard to get around to doing. But you know what? It was worth it for the better episodes of the season. I began to admire the efforts made to make these episodes stand out more. For every five generic looking beatdowns or blitz attacks, there was a decently cinematic moment, a unique interaction or creative use of abilities. Though I will admit, this is the season that you needed to grow up with in order to love, as there is not a lot of polish in most of these episodes. Even the ones that genuinely do hold up have their issues. Season 2, however, not only did the quality of the show noticeably improve, but it had even more ambitious ideas and possibilities for future episodes. And given how many episodes there are and how long the season was spanning for, let's just say that next time, I'm gonna take you for a ride. ON THE SUBSCRIBE BUTTON! <laughs>